So my talk's gonna be a little less dense on the slides here. We're gonna bring it down a little. We're actually gonna talk about laundry, right? Everyone knows how to do laundry, right? We all know how it works, right? We uh, get a big pile of clothes, they're all over the place, and you have to start folding them. And you know you have different clothes, right? I, I got a family of four, so I have my, my wife's clothes, her pants, I got kids' uh, socks all over the place. Um, you know, and I need a way of folding it and stuff. So I have a certain way of folding it. Um, and then my spouse has a certain way of folding it. The way she goes about it is she folds, which is great, right? You know, everyone, it's great that she's folding laundry and I don't have to do it. Um, but what she's gonna do, sorry, um, <laughs> is stack it all up in a big pile, right? So every time you get a piece of laundry and you're folding it, she just puts it into a pile and then on goes the next one. And you end up with a pile of, you know, some kid pants and some, my shirt and to put it all over the house, you have to, Walk over the house. Now, admittedly, I do appreciate the exercise. Can't argue with that. But, you know, parent, we're busy. We don't have time for that. So I have a slightly different way of doing it. I take over the whole living room. I'm talking the couch, the coffee table, the ottoman. I make separate piles for each kind of clothing, right? So kids' pants, kid number one pants, kid number two pants, something like that. I take over the whole living room. Then. I can go around the house putting my pants away, my shirts away, my kids' pants away, kids' shirts away, um, and it goes really fast. So what we're sort of doing here is making a space-time compromise. It sounds like software, but it's not. It's t-shirts uh, and pants and stuff like that, right? So I was able to use, take the same amount of time folding, right? It didn't take me like crazy long to fold the clothes. I just put them, I just took over more space, and then when I was able to put them away, I was able to save time. So that's sort of this classic trade-off that we as architects have to sort of think about, right? But what happens when you have 158 million t-shirts? <laughs> uh, that's last reported by Netflix, we have 158 million memberships with the service. When I started eight years ago, we had less than a million. So this, you can sort of get a sense of this growth and what happens over time and how things aren't the same as they used to be. It is not one monolith server we run in one little data center. It is the full-blown microservice architecture with tons of features, with services, calling services, calling services, calling services. I almost like to say ad infum because it does feel like that sometimes. That's a lot more complex than a few servers. There's a lot of servers. And there's problems that come up when you have that many servers and that many systems running all together, as you can imagine, right? Um, you might hear me say edge. Um, I mean, hopefully you read the title of the talk, edge is in there. That means the edge of this graph. So for most people, the far left here where it says edge, I'm talking about sort of these four nodes over here, the edge when the data comes into the service. There's a lot of other services going on here. I'm just not generally talking about that. I'm talking about edge. It's where I worked and it's where we saw the most scale. When we talk about that scale, there's problems. That's what I was alluding to and I sort of want to get to a little bit. Um, like debugability, right? So when you have a thousand servers, you have a thousand logs to go through and there's no way you're gonna to go to every single machine and, and look at the logs anymore. That's just out, that's not an option anymore, right? De debugging these problems becomes harder because a lot of problems can lurk in a thousand servers. Infrastructure, when you can keep some piece of infrastructure in one box and tracks everything, that's great. But as these number of servers is grow and you deal with 10,000 instances, 20,000 instances, um, it gets more difficult, right? Things start to fall apart, right? Um, and then the third point there, when the slides come back, um, is managing. Um, so I, we're, we subscribe to DevOps. I'm the developer, I'm operating it, I'm deploying it. I now have to deploy 1,000 instances. Now there's automation around it, but things just take longer now and I have to monitor more servers. Things just get harder. Scale of one, one projector. Also has problems, apparently. We'll see how this goes. This will be a very different talk. <laughs> um, so on the topic of scalability, right? So I sort of define it as, not that. Uh, this is gonna take me a second. Um, it's sort of the ability to take more traffic than without noticeable degradation, right? That I should be able, should be able to take uh, more traffic and not have the whole system sort of collapse. 
Well, let's see how that goes. Um, it means that I have problems that don't exist on a smaller system, but it also means that, that I want to give myself some headroom, right? I don't need to design for 10x scale. I just want 2x. I want to be able to fail over to a region. I want some new feature to ship and not have the system sort of fall over. That's where I'm talking about scalability and where I'm coming to here. I'm trying to give myself a little leeway here as, I, as my system grows. Because as you saw, the system's going to grow. That's sort of a given. Now, the way we do that, are we make some trade-offs, right? So we're architects here. This is sort of what we do. We look for a degree of freedom that we can move around in to make the solution work without you know, either costing lots of money or lots of servers or something like that. A classic trade-off here would be the cap theorem. Uh, Netflix, we have a service discovery service called Eureka. It's open source. Feel free to check it out. Um, it leans heavily on the A and the P, available and partition tolerant. And the way it does that, it takes all the instances it's keeping track of and it distributes it out over to all the other instances. Meaning, if you get a partition, it still knows about these instances in general. That's a trade-off, right? Um, it also means that when you have 10,000 instances and you add one more, you have to go tell the other 10,000 about that one new one. And that gets into the infrastructure side of things. Um, I'm going to focus on sort of the architectural things that we can do as architects and not on the policy decisions. If you have a policy to keep data for six months and you turn it to three months, that's less data. That will cost you less money. Go for it. Save less money. But that's not what I'm talking about. That's, not a, that's a turning the dial kind of thing. Like just turning the dial down, not super helpful. Not what I'm talking about, I should say. Um, likewise, if you run less servers, I, there'll be less problems. Don't run less servers just to run less servers. Don't run them hot. We know that we've learned that this causes additional latency, and that's not great either, right? I'm talking about being smart about this complexity as we add it. The things that I'm going to show, I have some case stories I'm going to go through. Um, each of them was implemented with one or two engineers over the course of a few weeks, maybe a month. Okay, the number of person months here is pretty low. I would say the total amount of work is not a lot. It's something that I think you guys could walk away with a little bit. I would say that all the technology we used was generally off the shelf. This is not some academic paper you have to implement. Um, you should feel perfectly capable of, of implementing the things that uh, I'm going to show here. I'm going to go through five use cases today. Okay? Um, I'm going to focus a little more at the beginning, and as I go on, they're going to get a little shorter and faster just so I can get through enough material. First one is, how do you tell someone who is logged in? How do you tell if they're a member? Right? That's pretty important. Right? You're going to show a very different website if someone is logged in or not, or if their membership um, is, is active or not. And you have to tell this on every request. Right? This is a stateless system. They're going to come in with your request, another request, another request. You have to know if they're um, a member or not. And you could say, oh, every request comes in the system. We just go to the database. Look it up. No big deal. It does become a big deal when you're doing 2 million requests per second. That is the scale that I'm talking about here. There are databases that scale like that. I would like to avoid it. That's my scalability message, is that I want to give myself a lot more leeway. If I don't have to put pressure on the database, let's not. So let's go back to what we have. We have cookies. That's how most of our devices talk to Netflix as a service. They give us HTTP cookies. These are long-lived cookies. They sit on your box for you know, a year, nine months. Um, but in there is a little expiration date that we put in. And this expiration date sort of tells us how long we can trust the cookie, right? So if it comes into our system and we crack it open and we look, we can look for this expiration. That's the dot in the middle you see up here. If it has not expired, we're just going to trust it. Right? This fits our business use case, right? At Netflix, you're, you know, if you're familiar with it, um, you're going to load it up. And that maybe was the last time you used the service was last night. So it's been eight hours. We're going to need to go make sure you're still a member. But after that, we can give you a new cookie that's good for eight hours. For the rest of your um, TV watching, binging for that night, we can sort of trust that cookie. And that fits our use case. If you were a member at the beginning of the night, you're probably a member at the end of the night. Works great. Um, let me just walk through how that works, because we're going to turn it up a notch later. What you have here is a layer 7 proxy. This would be sort of equivalent to an ALB, Nginx, something like that. In our case, we're using Zool. It's another open source project from Netflix that you can use. It lets us put custom logic in there. So if you see me putting code in this box and you can't, or you have to write it in Lua or something, um, that's what's going on here. We're doing this in Zool. Cookies come in, we crack it open, and we see if it's expired. If it's not expired, 
let it through. If it is expired, we're going to go to the server account service. Just you know, look up, hit the database, see if they're still a member. It's sort of straightforward. Um, either way, we're going to send it down, and once we sort of have this refreshed answer, if they're a member or not, we actually send out a new cookie that's good for eight hours, and that buys us uh, some time. The thing is, that wasn't good enough, right? So uh, product manager come back and said, no, we want to log someone out immediately, right? There's a lot of different use cases of this. You might be on the phone with customer service saying, hey, I see some weird activity. I just want everyone logged out. I don't want any activity on this. Um, maybe you've given your account to your, you know, your college kid, and they're watching some risque stuff, and you just don't want to know about it. Sign them out. I don't want to. I want to go on right away. So the business requirement now is we have to log them out instantaneously. But we don't want to hit the database. That's what we're trying to save here. So we came up with a system called Melnets. And that it's focused on that first eight hours. So what I have to do now is identify who has had activity on their account in that first eight hours and let the expiration thing take care of itself, right? That's done. We figured that out. So let's focus on that, that first eight hours. I need a set of customer IDs of who's changed their account in the last eight hours, right? 150 million members, how many have really hit the sign out of all devices button or called customer service? It's a small number. So here's our set. Thing is, it isn't that small, and I have to get it out. So there's two pieces to this. So one, I'm going to get the set. I'm going to send it out to my layer seven proxies. But let's talk about the size here, right? This, this goes a little bit to the scalability thing. If I just do this at a short cadence, four requests per second, that's still 115,000 entries I need to keep track of. Um, and it might be more, it might be less, depending on time of day, stuff like that. That's a lot of data to ship out to every single one of our layer seven proxies, right? There's thousands of them. I don't want to ship that much data, and I don't want to do it every minute, which is what we're going to be doing. So we introduced a bloom filter. Um, if you haven't heard of it, um, that's okay. So let me talk about why it's okay. Um, first, actually, what it gives us is it can answer this question. Is something possibly in a set? The high deg degree of uh, probability. Um, is it a bad interview question, what a bloom filter is? Yeah, you shouldn't have to know about it. Uh, would it does it feel like it's out of an academic paper? Yes, yes it does, because um, it's sort of shown like this. Um, is it available on Wikipedia? Yes, you can read about it. And that's where I want you to go for more details. I'm not going to get too much into it. It's also sitting in a Guava library. So if you're a Java developer, it's sitting in Guava, and you can use it. It's in 10 different libraries, and I promise you it's in your language of choice. It's sort of easy to use. But what it's giving us is we could take this set of IDs, x, y, z, and we splay it all over this sort of byte array. And this byte array is going to take up a lot less space than those individual IDs. Now, there's going to be some places where they conflict, that's OK. It's going to happen with a certain probability that we can tune, and we turn it way down or way up, I mean, whatever works. So let's talk about how this sort of works in here. Same layer seven proxy, same expired logic. But now, if you're not expired, we're going to send you through this bloom filter. And the way the bloom filter works is you just, it's a set. You say, is this thing in a set? That's the only thing we're trying to answer. It says yes or maybe. All right, sorry, no or maybe. In the no case, just flow it through. And that is the 99.99% of all requests. But for that small 0.01% uh, of the time, we get a maybe answer. We go to the account service. We look it up. So this means we're actually hitting the database a little bit more, but not much. This is very reasonable. Um, it means, uh, yeah. Um, I'll get into why. Um, I'm going to talk about how I set it up. I'm not going to go as much detail in the other use cases, but I think this is really relevant because I want to sort of show how accessible this is. We had an account service, right? That already existed. You know, you can't, this doesn't work without an account service. It was already sending events out over some sort of Kafka-like stream. This, this already existed for us. So we wrote a service that just listened to events and then saved them to the database. It's like, five, you know, things go right. This is like five lines of code. This is pretty simple, straightforward. We then read from this database every five, uh, every one minute. Say, give me all the entries for the last eight hours. We put that into the Bloom filter, and we ship it out. And we ship it out using a pub subsystem. Now, we have one internally. It's not open sourced. But there are other ones available, right? So um, Apache has one um, that came out of Yahoo, which is very similar to the one that we have. Redis has a pub sub. Google offers one. Pub sub is generally available. And we just sort of throw it out there. Here's the new uh, list of all the customer IDs in the last eight hours who might have changed their account. And now it's on our layer seven proxy. So we now have this sort of near real-time data set we can look at to log people out. We haven't increased the amount of calls to the database, so that was sort of one of our goals here. Um, we're pretty happy with it. Um, but we did have to make some trade-offs. 
right? So one, there's now a probabilistic data structure in there that I trust you, every new employee that joins the team is gonna have to go to Wikipedia and read up on it. Um, it is a library, you do get the call, but you should understand what's going on. So we sort of traded a little more code complexity um, to get this sort of neat space savings. Um, I'd also say the off-the-shelf components, right? We could have sent those events from the auth service, the one that's doing this account stuff, straight to the layer seven um, servers, the, the, those proxies. That would work, that would be like instantaneous, right? You get, but there's a lot of problems that could happen there, and we could handcraft it, but we could also just use off-the-shelf components, right? I used off-the-shelf uh, Kafka and PubSub, and I wrote a service that's like five lines of code, or two services that's five lines of code. That was worth it. I was much more willing to have two simple services than try and take my account service, which is super important, with my layer seven proxy, which is super important, and put a whole bunch of complicated code in there. So that's the trade-off I sort of made here. Okay, so that was the first use case. I'm gonna go through four more. Um, we're gonna talk about the needle in the haystack kind of problem, right? I talked about how when you have a thousand servers and you're trying to find a log in there, how do you find it? How do you find this problem? And we need to solve this um, all the time, right? This is just a classic debugging kind of thing. You gotta find an error message. Now, if I do this at the pre-stated two million requests per second, and let's just say every request with some metadata is about three kilobytes, and I you know, I showed you that graph. This gets, they're gonna call other microservices and we wanna record all those. You multiply that out, that's 4.6 petabytes a day. Now, you could do that. You can put that in Elasticsearch. I trust you, there's a log company out there that's willing to take your check and put this, store all this. Um, I'd like to avoid that. Um, so let me just start with the basic architecture, the pictures. Um, you have a service, it's publishing all these events, all these logs, and let's say we put into Elasticsearch, you can search for it. Uh, for those who can't see in the back, there's a thick red line between the service and the Elasticsearch, and a thin line to, let's say, Kibana, your UI over it. But you have to load all the stuff into Elasticsearch, and I don't want to put that 5.6 petabytes in there. In comes Mantis, a recently open source tool from Netflix that we've been using internally for a while, and I absolutely love it, and I think you will too afterwards. It gives us, it is an event stream processing. It is not specific to logs, it's there for events. Um, and it's gonna give us two big constructs. It is going to put an agent in your service, okay? This is a local agent that you run that you sort of give it the event, and it is responsible for getting that event out of your box. So think of it as a, for every request that comes in, we create an event. That would be our equivalent of a log and it's gonna send it to a Mantis source job. So it has a cluster that's dedicated to receiving these events and sending it on to somewhere else. Now, I've drawn it with really thick lines because I haven't told you anything else about why this makes it special. The thing that makes it sort of special is that Mantis has a query language, okay, MQL, Mantis query language, pretty obvious. Um, so you can write this query, you can say, show me all the people in Brazil watching episode three of Stranger Things on an iPad. Right, super specific. That, that's a select statement right there with some where clauses. That will get loaded into the source job, and it's only gonna allow things that match that filter to go out. So now we're talking about what's going to Elasticsearch. It's a lot smaller. So for the people in the back, there's a thin red line now going to Elasticsearch. There is a trickle of data. Only those people in Brazil on an iPad watching episode three of Stranger Things. Um, what gets a little bit better with Mantis is it takes that MQL and pumps it down to all the agents. So you might have 1,000 servers, 10,000 servers, five. That query is gonna go down to the agent. He's gonna run the pre-filter and only send off box those messages. And that is a trickle of events. Okay, I can get extremely specific tracking. I can see these requests come in live. They have sort of a, a browser sort of plugin where you can watch this stream. I'm getting it live, no huge overhead. I'm not storing tons of data here. This is what sort of makes Mantis sort of a big win for us. And the thing that it does is avoid work, right? We're not shipping all this data off box, right? We had to sort of put an agent in our box, um, but we avoided a whole lot of work, a lot of network traffic going on here. And I'd say those are the two pieces here. I'll, I'll start with scale to scales from zero sort of solution here. I can have this thing on all night. It's only gonna match those iPads in Brazil. That's awesome. I could leave it on all month, no big deal. I could go home at nighttime and turn everything off and there's no additional impact to the system. So the trade-off here is, yeah, I don't have long-term historical data here, but I do get a really easy way of starting up a new query. I don't care about the cost because it's gonna be so optimally efficient to what I am looking for. That's the trade-off. The other trade-off is this Mantis query language, right? I had to put an agent in my box. There's something in my runtime now. Um, they control it if I wanna get 
more complicated and it's not part of the query language, I can't do it. But this is something where I'm willing to hand it off to them. I trust this team to put code in my box. I trust this team to enhance this query language over time. Um, I mean, I could have put custom code in my box, but I couldn't put that custom code in all the boxes. And so I'm willing to make the trade-off. Okay, so that was two case stories. Let's talk about the third one. This one is a little specific to when you have extremely common data for your requests. So let me explain that a little bit. Membership, that's a common one. Or a user preference. So let's say they are a premium member and you will always give them a little bit more data on every request. Okay, so every request comes in your box. Based on the membership, maybe you do something different. Something for Netflix, an equivalent might be membership levels, right? There's a four stream and a two stream and a four stream. Knowing if it's a one stream or a four stream helps us change our behavior a little bit. So this is important data for us, and, but you might have more important data for a user preference or something like that. So super common data. And you can imagine how you load it, right? Request comes in the system, gets loaded into your API, he requests the service plan from the database. Call goes to mid-tier, he requests it. Call goes to mid-tier B, he requests it. Goes to mid-tier C, C, she requests it. Okay, we got a bunch of requests coming out of the database. One request in, four requests to the database. This is sort of that kind of scalability thing I'm trying to avoid a little bit. So let me layer in one thing. We have this thing called passports. Now, we introduced this for identity. It tells you who this call is made on behalf of. And we do this right at this first layer seven proxy. We figure out who is this customer and, and, and sort of um, what is their customer ID, that kind of stuff. And we were passing it through our system. We're gonna make a change here. We're gonna actually take this very common data and we're gonna load up right at the beginning. We're gonna shove it into this passport and have it passed down. So now one request comes in and one request to the database. So we've actually got a much more linear scaling. So this is important to us. Everybody along the way doesn't have to make a database request. So now there's actually, it's a little bit faster. Right? He doesn't even have to request it. He's getting handed this, this data structure now. You should all be thinking from the keynote, hey, but what if you write to it? You want some consistency here, right? This is the non-linearizability that he was talking about. If mid-tier B along the way changes the plan, Right? You're in the process of, you change the plan and now you want to render something for them. You want a consistent experience across them. And if mid-tier B here, I've shown in maroon on the right-hand side here, is right into the database, and then a request goes to mid-tier C, he's still going to see the blue dot, the blue membership. That could be our inconsistent experience, right? If these are eventual consistent databases, um, and, and we want to do better, right? We don't want quorum on this database. We don't want to go through all the troubles you saw in the keynote to try and give a consistent experience. Well, it turns out the passport is this contract where if you are changing the passport, you have to send it back up. Okay, what that means is when mid-tier B is making a change, he's going to create a new passport with this new data, send it back up to A. A is now responsible for using that data when it calls mid-tier C. Now mid-tier C is getting a consistent experience, irrelevant of the state of the database. You know, he might get back to you next week. It might be made out of pigeons. Who knows? It's going to come later. Um, What's not shown in the slide is that passport is actually passed up to API and up to L7 proxy, and he can do something, right? He could update your cookies with this new data or some aspect of this data. Um, and it doesn't have to be the full data, right? We can make a reference to uh, an immutable data object, right? So we don't need the full object going around, but the key is we're passing this data up and down through this sort of stream. Um, so we made like this small change where we're sort of passing around some more heavy data, and we did have to put something in the layer seven proxy, but now we get this great experience where we can get some consistent experience. Now, this is near the land of caching, I get that. If you need to cache things, you should cache it. This is only applicable if you're going to, at the first entry point, be willing to look it up. Um, so use caching if you need to. This is a little bit of a unique uh, use case. We got it via two trade-offs, right? So one is data passing. We had to sort of move past, I am an isolated mid-tier microservice, and I will call this other microservice, and we will not share any states. Well, I'm saying, let's make that, let's switch that up. Let's put a little extra data on the wire, right? Yeah, it's nice to keep your request small, but if I grow my request size by one or two K, it's not gonna take down the network, or at least I haven't taken down the network yet. Um, the other thing here is a heavier data structure, right? I'm not just passing along, you know, like a 64-bit int um, through my system. I made a heavier data structure. All the people in the system now have to understand this passport. They need to know how to read it. Some of them need to know how to change it. 
that's a trade-off, right? Now I need to coordinate with a lot more teams, but I'm willing to make that trade-off to get this sort of consistent database request. Okay, so that's three. Let's go on to the fourth one, uh, device types. So Netflix, you can watch on many different types of devices, over 2,000 different devices you can watch on. Um, we have learned that it is useful to categorize these devices, and not just individual devices, right? My app, iPad versus your iPad, but like all iPads and all old iPads and new iPads. We want to group these things together. And it sort of looks like this. The numbers aren't important. All you need to know, there's some gobbledygook on the left. We have to convert it to some useful number on the right. That's what this service is doing for us. And let me make it really clear why it's important to us. This is an error metric, a real one taken from like yesterday. Um, something is going on. I don't know what device is doing it. And to my point earlier, when something goes bad, it goes bad for all types of devices. So if it's for Android devices, which it turned out to be Android, um, you can see real quickly a bulk of this is Android because right? I group these things together. Okay, This grouping is really important for telemetry. We need this to debug issues in production. So this is, we're gonna consider critical data that we need to have available to us. It's also considered ridiculously cacheable. Okay, this doesn't change very much. Keep that in mind. When I join the team, every mid-tier service would call this DTS service and say, do you have anything new? 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 And when he'd reply, he'd give you 100 megabytes of XML. Yippee. Uh, somewhere in there, they felt like, let's put a backup system in case DTS gets, you know, falls over, which it could do because everybody's asking for 100 megabytes of, of uh, XML. Um, they put in a PubSub system as a backup. Say, hey, if there's a change, we'll just push it out over the PubSub system. Well, like, it didn't take long to realize the backup was better than the real thing. So we just threw out the real thing, used the backup. And what it did is let us take DTS out of the critical path, right? If DTS isn't around, no big deal. We have this pub subsystem that is managed by another team. It's rock solid. It is infrastructure from our point of view. And it pushes out what was 100 megabytes of XML. We did better. We moved it to Proto. We compressed it. It got better. But um, the pub sub was the big thing. But even there, we start to look a little bit deeper and realize, well, what is this data? What's the real business requirement? How fast do I really need to get these updates out? Well, it didn't take long. You start asking them, like, well, when does new data flow in? Oh yeah, it flows in all the time and, and we should see results. Okay, well what's this data? Well this data is someone in China wants to add, create a new TV, they tell Netflix about it, they wanna go through certification. So in March, they tell us about a new kind of TV, they start the certification process, they eventually build the TVs, they certify the Netflix app on it, it shows up at Best Buy and then you buy it, okay? That's like March to December. That's like nine month lag before we see this device in production. This data can be nine months stale and no one's really gonna know about it. Okay, that took a little bit of the five whys. We're like, why, why do you need this data? Why do you need this data? Well, it turns out they didn't need it for nine months. So we start to actually embed it in the jar. All right, so we had a client library, we'd ship it out, and we just put like old data, whatever the data of the day was in there. And we'd compressed it to small enough at this point that it really wasn't a big overhead. And so now actually the data lives in the jar. And you can still use PubSub and you can pump up updates, but if PubSub goes down, this highly critical data is available to everybody. It might be old, it might be nine months old, but that's fine. Um, along the way, we tried a whole bunch of other things, like, oh, we'll send incremental updates. Like we were getting really fancy, but it was getting really complex. I'd much rather, um, simple over easy in this case. So we just sort of ditch all those plans and just, just put it in the jar, you're done. Um, so there's sort of two trade-offs we're talking about here. So one is business tune fallbacks. This is like really going back to the business and asking exactly what do you need, what do you need? Right, if we're gonna be architects and we're looking for that freedom of moving things around, we really do need to know what they're really asking for. Because if they ask for something real time, if you go back to the log all the users out example earlier, they were like real time. Didn't take long to say real time is like within 10 minutes. It's a very different definition of real time. Um, likewise, leverage existing infrastructure, right? So one was the pub sub piece, which is still important. We do like to get updates out if you are testing internally or something like that. Um, but I'd much rather use that existing infrastructure whenever possible than have my own service where I can tune it, change it immediately. I will use in existing infrastructure. That is the trade-off we made, and we we're very happy with not having to get paged for a data service. So that is 
four use cases. Let's talk a little bit about sharding. Um, there's different definitions of this. I'm gonna give one out there, and this is sort of runtime refactoring, right? If you can imagine refactoring your code, you might hopefully not change your tests, right? You change your code, tests stay the same. You've just moved things around. Functionally, it is the same thing. I'm talking about this at a runtime level. I'm gonna take my runtime system, and I'm gonna sort of move things around, but it still does the same functionality. Okay, that's, that's what I mean by sort of sharding it out. So we're taking chunks of code and moving it around. Um, in this context, I'm gonna make reference to a message security layer. That is literally the name. You can find it on GitHub. It's another open source project from Netflix. Um, it's shortened to MSL. I will pronounce it as MISL. Um, it is a secure messaging framework, right? So it has encryption and authenticity and replay protection and stuff like that. It's like TLS, that's probably the best equivalent I can give you. In our case, it has some additional business things that it gives us that we want from our business, but think of it like a TLS. But unlike TLS, you can't just go to Amazon and say, give me a load balancer that supports missile. Um, you can't terminate at the load balancer. So we're gonna terminate at API, right? So same sort of architecture, right? We're on the edge, we've got a layer seven proxy sending traffic to the, the first level. And this API service is doing a lot of things. So it's gonna terminate the security layer. It's gonna run some groovy scripts because that's just how it works. Um, it's gonna have clients for everything else in the system, right? You saw that diagram, it, it, go, it spreads out really fast. So this API service is going to have client libraries for everybody out there. It's a beast of a machine and it's doing lots of things. And one of the things was missile and we had our code and we had to get it in here and we sort of wanted to get it out. So that's what we're gonna do. So we refactored it, sharded it, and took that logic out and put it into its own service, okay? Now you can't entirely put it off to its own service. In our case, we have to put a small little piece in the L7 proxy, right? It is a security layer, but it's also an encryption. We just need to decrypt it, encrypt it. So we keep those simple operations up at the layer seven proxy, right? That, of the functionality of missile we're talking about here, there's the encrypt decrypt. We're gonna leave that at the L7 proxy. And then the more complicated pieces, right? We gotta do key exchange, we have to authenticate devices. That we're gonna sort of move off to its own service, right? Does all the same stuff, we've just moved things around. Um, we were doing this for our own operational benefit. Like, we didn't think much would change. But then people were like, you must have messed up. Look what happened to our CPU, it went way down. <laughs> people must not be calling us. Well, turns out, it just got cheaper to run API. It took less CPU to run API. And like, we sort of anticipated this, but we did not expect um, a drop, like 31% drop. Like, whoa, oh, we'll take it, right? These are, these are free, right? Um, right off the bat, you guys, that's, that should be enough. Like, presentation over, you should refactor your code. Um, but then we saw it in latency. We're like, okay, that's interesting. It's always better to get better latency, but there isn't huge overhead to the encrypt decrypt, or if it was, it doesn't account for this much of a change, right? A 30% decrease in average, and a 29% in P99. Okay, if you can get a P99 reduction, that's awesome. We were really happy about that. But when you look at latency, it doesn't take long to start looking at garbage collection. And that's what we looked at. And we found this drop, okay? And the only reason you sort of see like a delay here is that we were just doing like a slow rollout of the, of the feature. The top, I know there's no axes here, is a non-trivial number, like hundreds of milliseconds, if not seconds, down to what we, we consider zero. Okay, it got a lot better, um, the amount of time we spent in garbage collection, which is what gave us the latency, which gave us the less cost. What we couldn't see when Missile and Groovy Scripts and all these things were all in one API service was it had some really bad GC characteristics. And it was to the point where the JVM couldn't really deal with all these things going on. And when we separated out, the JVM could say, oh, that's what you meant to do. Oh, I can deal with that, I can optimize around that. And so we actually are now running one missile service and like one API service where we were previously running three because the JVM, in our case, um, our VM, can be more efficient now. It knows what your code is doing. It can do analysis on it. We can do analysis on it, right? So I can go to this missile service, profile it, and see what it's doing. When it was over an API, too much is going on. I couldn't look at a flame graph and reason about it. By moving it out, I can now get simpler sort of operations out of it. And that's what sort of makes it um, a big win, I would say, is that you now can reason about the operations piece of this when you have this sort of monolith and why you should do it. So the big overhead, the trade-off, is 
I'm going to take a lot more operational overhead. I have to run a whole new service that is critical to running of Netflix. But my other critical service is now going to become more reliant. Um, and that's a pretty good trade-off, right? And we can also now separate, right? The person running API doesn't have to be the team that runs Missile. So there, that was worth the trade-off in this case. Um, so we sort of went over five use cases that we saw that we did at Netflix. And I get that our scale isn't the biggest scale ever, but it's also not trivial. These aren't necessarily problems that you will see all the time. It won't affect everybody. I get that. Uh, I'm just hoping and give you some insight how we think about it, right? It goes back to that scalability. I want to make sure I give myself some leeway, right? If the idea is to just hit the database more in a linear fashion, I'm going to think twice about it and try and do something sublinear, right? Something that grows at a more reasonable rate so that as our customers keep coming in and we get more memberships, um, we don't have to keep re-architecting our entire system. Um, Bonus trade-off, uh, do laundry. So the trade-off is you have to do laundry, but uh, the benefit here is your family loves you for it. So definitely do laundry. Um, you could reach me at this email or on Twitter. Um, if you did get a t-shirt and you don't like the size, come up to me afterwards. I can exchange it for you and stuff like that. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much. So I know I did go fast over some of the stuff. It is a lot. The lesson here is there are tools available for you. Um, there is a Q&A now, uh, and people are going to walk around with mics. So I assume it's the generic th throw your hand up. Mike comes over, ask your question, um, and I'll try and answer it. Feel free to go deep on any of these points. You can ask it, I can repeat it. Um, for the Mantis system. Can you turn the, off the mic on, please? For the uh, Mantis system, um, you guys are aggressively sampling and doing queries and all this stuff. Uh, my question to you was with this system, you guys are effectively dropping a lot of data that can help you for forensic analysis. So, how do you approach that with this system? Uh, so, the general question is um, that we are filtering a lot of data, which means we're throwing away a lot of data. How do we sort of do further analysis on this useful data? We still can, right? So um, I don't have to be the only one writing a query. Anyone can write a query. There are still systems that flow off that do get recorded, but then you can uh, change it, right? So th I mentioned that it's a query language. It has a select statement. And you can say, select this field, this field, this field, and get very small bits of data. And the team that's interested in those small bits of data can just do 100% of all the data. Well, I could say, select star on the small bit of data. So we actually both can play on the same box and run parallel requests and still get what we're looking for. Um, yes, if you truly have to offload the box, maybe the agent in that diagram does still throw the data off box, but it still goes to this Mantis, um, I forget what the middle box was called. Um, that's, that can then filter it and send it to the right places. So if you can't get the benefit at the first layer of the agent, you can get it at the second layer and that's fine. Yeah, so the question is about the eventuality, like what if I needed this data in the past? That's the trade-off that we're making, right? So we have to sort of say, that said, we've been doing analytics for a while. We know the things that we do want. Usually what I find is it's some new service, some new feature I turned on, and it's new stuff. And that's where we're focusing most of our time. But there is some older uh, data, historical data, that's used for analytics for sure. I think we're moving the question over to our, my left. You're right. Uh, my, qu my question is, the sharding part, you moved uh, the code, you split the code to, to another service, then I improve the performance, or in general, it's like I don't understand how the performance is improved hugely. So same amount of work is happening. So you would think this would just be literally one plus one equals two. But in our case, we run in a virtual machine, and our code gets jitted over time. And so one of the things that actually happened to us was that we had memory being allocated. And in the scope of a request, the JVM couldn't tell if this data was sort of in the Eden space and was new data, or it was long-lived space. Because what was going on with the span of a request was so much. 
And when it was on two different machines, running in a smaller request scope, the JVM and the jitting could, could, or in the memory analysis could go in and say, hey, you actually don't use this memory very long. I can throw it out, garbage collection it for free. And this guy could do it too. So both of them are making much smarter garbage collection um, insights. And that's where a lot of the performance came from there. But it also opened up like a Pandora's box. Like now that we had a dedicated service, now we could start performance tuning it and getting the real kind of benefits of like tweaking your code and getting really bad like hot loops and stuff like that. So some stuff for free because of, of, of garbage collection, but also like a plethora of new ability to, to do performance tuning. Okay. Over my Hi. Uh, my question is about your uh, passport. Uh, payload. Did you, is it something that you would um, put on the header or how did you, what was the mechanism behind how you would actually store that data so it would be uh, transitive across requests? Yeah. And then the uh, secondary follow-up is when the service needed to update the passport, what was the uh, interface mechanism to get it back? Was it in the response yeah. or was it some other way? Yeah, the, the two very related questions. Um, how do we pass this passport through? Um, a ma vast majority of requests are HTTP. You can send headers. So it is considered metadata as far as the request. We tried to leave the request um, untouched, unscathed, and it was sent as uh, HTTP headers. Um, in gRPC, which we also use, there is metadata fields we can use. But we also, at some point, said, hey, this is so useful. Let's just make it the request, right? If your service wants a passport, it wants to know who you're acting on behalf of, take that as an argument. So as much as we did use um, it as a sideband channel, um, we, we move towards, let's just move it into the request if you could, right? If you're writing a new service, we would ask you put it directly in the request. Because if you're going to try and reproduce that request, it'd be nice to just say, here's the payload, here's who, the passport. Um, on the way up, um, it is HTTP headers on the way back also, or put it into the request on, on, on the way back up. I'm going to let Randy run around a little. <clears throat> I'm uh, curious about your thoughts on performance of uh, serving recommendation engine-based results, uh, specifically with two scenarios. Uh, one where they are uh, sorted, uh, filtered, uh, and largely around items whose state, particularly around availability, changes very rapidly. So in the scenario where an item is available for maybe two minutes and now it goes away or it goes into a different state that means it needs to be way further down because it's just a different class of thing. And then it comes back, you know, a minute later. Hmm. I don't think I follow the part about the recommendations and data changing versus becoming unavailable. Well, sorry. Specifically recommendation around the fact that, you know, if you have all this stuff in Elasticsearch, you can be updating it and you can do your search and that's really, really easy. But when it's a recommendation engine type of scenario, right. the sort is highly influenced by the user item relationship. Uh, and that, you know. Sure, so um, I'm, not, I'm a little bit familiar with the, how the recommendation engine. It is different, it has different trade-offs for sure. And it is not very cacheable, right? Every customer has a different right. um, sort of set of recommendations that we want to do and stuff. Um, in our case, nothing I was showing is really uh, customer specific. In that case, they do lean a lot more towards uh, memcached-like solutions, um, pushing updates to memcached. I think it gets a little more into what the keynote was talking about and, and how, if you want that different characteristic, you would choose one of those systems. Um, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, for Passport, you mentioned that you implemented some sort of contract. Um, and I can imagine that contract involves being able to deal with the same message twice, essentially message replay, because you're basically like taking a request that you mutated and then shoving it back like through all the previous stages. It does um, not go through previous stages. Okay. It's for subsequent requests, right? So in the model, in that picture, mid-tier A is going to call B, then C, then D, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so something happened in B, then he called C. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not happening in parallel. They're, it's a serial sort of form. Right, but the uh, preceding stages have to deal with the same request essentially happening multiple times. So if there's any side effects, mm -hmm. um, like how difficult was it to get people to buy into the contract, essentially? Like how, how much fallout was there from... Uh, implementing this like new contractual thing that's yeah, not yeah. really obvious. There's two pieces. There's a carrot and a stick. I mean, one, 
official title, cat herder, um, had to, but a big piece of it, if you are going to change data and you want other people to see it, you have to do this contract, right? If you want to be a service changing the data and, and it's not being reflected in other places, right? It's not getting saved into that cookie. If you're not getting it back up to that layer seven proxy, um, your data doesn't go out, so does your service even exist? So they had a, there, was a, there was a reason why they'd want to participate for sure. And very few services are changing it and needing the changes reflected. So we had to talk to very few teams on that front. Um, the, the other contract was just you receive a passport and then you send it back down. This is sort of classic just tracing, right, going through like that. Um, so that was very easy. We already had tracing mechanisms that we could use. And for the flowing back up, um, part of it. It was a, if you want your data to be updated, you better send the password back up. So it sort of melded really nicely for us. Hi, my question is around the device type. You mentioned when you, um, um, you, you have a subscription that being used after nine months, you create kind of pops of, pops of model and you create kind of jar or something you mentioned. Uh, how do you, like, uh, do you store uh, that pops up model and communicate back when a de device come online or in production? Or how do you, um, the entire cycle, uh, the performance or the uh, management of uh, getting into something in production from the day noticeable? How do you do that? Let me see if I get the question right. Just sort of how do we sort of manage the, the getting that data pushed out to production? Yeah. Right, yeah. so it flows so two ways. Is a, you need to store somewhere and you need to communicate back or? Um, and we have like a, a source of truth, you know, a database that can store the, the, the truth of it, right? There's 2,000 devices, but it's truly, that's not a big database. Um, that is just a source of truth that we live, uh, that we look at. Um, and it's a matter of the system that makes a change to the database also knows how to push a change to us so we could push it out over the pub sub. Um, I mean, that, that's, that coordination wasn't too bad, right? That's sort of, um, they know they made a change, so they made sure to tell us, right? It does give us this dual world where the source of truth is over here, which is not production data, and we're pushing data out to production. We really want to keep those two worlds different, really. The team that's optimized for making those source of truth changes isn't the team that knows how to really run things in production, right? Or doesn't have that training or that experience. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question per se, though. So do you have an orchestrator, or do you have something which oh, gets? Oh, sure. Um, you know what? They, they call us. I don't call them. So like when they make that change, and they've made a change to the UI, they tell us that there's a change. Um, so it's actually, so that was our decoupling. Right? We wanted a nice, clean decoupling between the team that was not doing production changes to us, which is the team that was doing production changes. So they would just call our service and say, hey, there's new data. So we, there wasn't a lot of coordination in that front. Is one more Any more questions? There. Oh, wait, okay. Well, thanks for sticking around. Hi, um, my name is Phil. I was really impressed by just the scaling from one, mi uh, one million to 158 million. Uh, this is less about engineering, more about uh, ideation in terms of, I'm sure at one million, you guys had kind of thoughts about how to architect this thing that you wouldn't have imagined doing at 158 million. I'm curious from an ideation perspective, like where did you draw over the years, like your team drew uh, inspiration about practices that you um, would need to learn from? Because obviously your team at one million kind of has a limited kind of knowledge of what the scale needs to be, you know? But, and then over the years, you need to either internally be really creative or look outside for solutions. Like in terms of the eight years, what did you, uh, how did you guys get um, inspiration for practices and ideation? Curious. Well, I, I, was, I wasn't working on the product the whole time, um, but I can tell you that it comes from a few different veins. One is a willingness to rewrite things, right? If I'm telling you that scalability is giving yourself some wiggle room and you can grow 2x, what happens means that you have to be willing to rewrite it when you get to 2x and prepare for 4x. So there is a willingness to rewrite. Like I think when people would propose, um, people would propose, hey, we need to rewrite it, we were pretty open to the idea. So there has to be a willingness to rewrite. There's value in that. Um, the other half of it, I would say, is that teams would partition themselves and take ownership of it, right? So if my team is a small team and we're seeing growing pains, that's how we know that it's time to re-architect within our sort of smaller domain, right? We don't have an architect saying, hey, we think there's general re-architecture needed. Um, we did it in sort of a smaller scale. And so that really let teams really know when and how they should start thinking about the scale of the issue. Because they have that responsibility. If their service goes down, that's on them. So they knew that pain. 
Great, so let's thank Justin one more time, please.